empathy with your client is and showing that empathy with their position is probably one of the greatest tools for success. Business of Architecture, episode 390. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking to the fabulous Paul Iden of Agency PSI. Paul has been a guest on the Business of Architecture UK in the past and offers a really deep and fascinating insight into the psychology of architects, um, the psychology of marketing to architects, and also some some deep truths about the industry and how we like to work. So Paul has over 30 years of experience in construction, architecture, and marketing. He's run his own architecture firm up in Manchester called OMI Architects, and currently now runs his own marketing agency where he develops brand and engagement strategies for architects and with manufacturers who are often working in and around the construction space. Paul is also the vice president of the Manchester Society of Architects and a council member of the RABA Northwest. In this episode, we investigate what makes architects tick, the collective value of the word architect as a brand, and how understanding our psychology helps us become better salespeople, marketeers, and ultimately better architects. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Paul Iden. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Paul, welcome Hello. to the Hi, business Ryan. of architecture. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, a little bit rough after my um, wonderful vaccine yesterday. Um, sore arms, sore joints, but a very small price to pay for such a miraculous thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm, I'm actually ecstatic and sore at the same time. Good. But, it's an amazing experience and it's nothing short of miraculous. No, well, like you, like you were saying, we've kind of done, was it 21 million people have been vaccinated already? Oh, and it, the system they've got going is phenomenal. You know, um, volunteers, NHS staff and, you know, some military were there and they're just, it's like a well-oiled machine. I mean, they mm. know what they're about, you know, and uh, and they're all friendly and it's just, they, you know, they they can see people are nervous and they relax them and stuff. It's, it actually made me quite, like I said, a bit tearful that this, there, there are these people working, you know, on these sort of things, that are taking risk and yeah. committed. And you think, how much money do you want? <laughs> you know, <laughs> put, put the national insurance up, I'll pay it, you know. Um, but no, and, uh, and yeah, and uh, my, bar, my, my wife bought me a mug. Uh, for Valentine's <laughs> Day, I think he should be. He's probably going to be. Um, he's going to be next prime minister. <laughs> yeah, Chris Whitty and uh, Jonathan Van Tam, isn't it? They're phenomenal, amazing. Anyway, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm okay. Thank you. Good, good. Well, always a pleasure to sit down and pick your brains and speak with you about your vast expertise and all <laughs> things, all things marketing, all things architecture. And today, what I wanted to talk to you about was, well, a subject that's very close to my heart, um, the psychology of the architect. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I'm, I'm curious to know what your, first of all, why you've got an interest in this, just so people, people who, aren't in, who don't know your work, um, for starters, like how your career has evolved, because that's quite interesting in itself, how you've been you know, the principal director, owner of a successful architecture practice and then you've moved to the dark side and exactly. and and kind of become one of the uh you know a thought leader and uh agency owner in a marketing agency and you still work with primarily suppliers manufacturing companies that are selling to architects so yeah yeah understanding the cycle <laughs> <You're quite laughs> my, my psychology and this is i say this to my clients and uh, who are uh, uh, actually fantastic people um marketers are an interesting bunch you know you get you, there's a lot of them and 
ones in B2B tend to be different to consumer times. Right. They tend to be a bit more, um, well, they're sort of the, you know, the, 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 the kind of um, more directed in some ways, whereas consumer is a bit more creative, but business, business is a bit more, so, well, they say rational, but it doesn't work like that. But anyway, it's, 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 it's still an emotional business. <clears throat> but um, yeah, as I always say to them, I say that um, better to spend your money in ways that architects are saying what they want than doing what you think they want. So my view was go out and find and ask architects, well, what is it you find useful? Um, I did this survey three times and it's come back the same every time, more or less. Yeah, give it give it a take. The kind of things that architects are looking for are kind of things you'd expect. Yeah, and um, and so I'd basically say invest in the things that architects help architects do their job, um, run their practice, um, give them insights, give them tools, give them techniques, give them knowledge, because uh, it's a very difficult job being an architect. I tell them it's, you know, they they, they get attacked by everybody, but it'd be a, I can't imagine a world without them and I wouldn't want to. Mm. Um, so yeah. So the, the prerequisite of that, of course, is reaching back into my own past and the people I know and start to think, well, what makes architects tick? And a few, fa- it's like a couple of really important questions I asked myself and three really, and, and I'm, I'm, I'd really like to do research on this a bit deeper First one is, does the nature of the architecture training select for certain types of people at the outset? In other words, do certain, what type of people want to do architecture? Right. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about any physical characteristics. I'm talking about interests, motivations, and ambitions and what their beliefs are, regardless of other you know, characteristics. The second question is, now, I, I, I personally think that's unlikely because I don't think, um, and again, I, 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 you know, I don't know this definitively. It'd be interesting to find out whether people who apply for an architecture course understand what architecture really is. Yeah. Because my feeling is that most people, the penny doesn't drop on last for a couple of years doing it, I think. And, and, and it's... And think, it- and it's, it's often a way I speak to students and kind of the most classic answer is, well, I'm good at maths and good at, good at art. Yeah. And it's Which is exactly like, what I said, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of like, well, and then, then you should be an architect. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it could be something as simple as that. It's to do with, you know, careers advice or a website or something and an algorithm, who knows? The second one is slightly more interesting is does the process of the architect training select for certain types of personality through the process in other words does it select out people who don't go down a certain path yeah you know what i mean it's the crit i mean one thing is the crit system yeah. the crit system will select for certain types of personality because to get through that over a course of five years or so you've got to develop a fairly thick skin i think and going to be, be able to stand up for your ideas. <clears throat> and a lot of people will think it's, it's not for me. I'm perfectly reasonable. It's not a judge. I'm not judging people. I'm just trying to understand. So does the process, in other words, does the group you have at the end who do their part three, has the education process selected for their personality type? You can argue it's selected for skills. It's selected for co- competence or ability or, but does it select for certain personality types? And there's some evidence that it does, mm. although it's it could be doing it could be doing the bigger study. And the third one, which is even more frightening, actually, is does the architecture training take a young person who? Oh, we know that people's brains keep developing until they're in their mid twenties. Yeah. Plast- and, and beyond that, it's plasticity. But that up to twenty five is when all you know, there's a huge amount of shaping and and you know sort of rearranging going on people's brains does it change their personality does it actually alter their brains so at the end of it they're not 
the same person that they start now it happens to everybody all the time anyway yeah. but is it in a particular direction so th- to me they're the three really interesting questions um i think there's like so the first bit i think it's you know fairly sort of broad kind of like oh i've got these a levels with me it was maths physics and arts yeah yeah it's what yeah. you'd expect oh architecture could you know Mother of the arts, oh, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't, and you, and you also don't have to quite make a choice about anything specific. And you know, you're kind of sold. Certainly nowadays as well, you're sold sold the idea that architect, you know, doing an architecture degree can can lead to all sorts of other things. And it kind of has the tick of the box with the parents because it's like, oh, it's a respectable pressure, uh, profession. So people are kind of pleased. Makes it an I'm, easy I'm, choice. I'm constantly amazed that people. In the age of Google, don't research more. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, they, they, they find ample evidence that it's not quite as straightforward as that. And you know, um, but you know, um, as I said, we need architects. We need good architects. So, yeah, um, we need people with that skill set. And you know, so for me, it's kind of like those are the burning, really interesting questions. And of course, does that affect the way that they operate in the world afterwards? Which it must do. And I think I told you before, there was the piece of research that I saw on this was using Myers-Briggs testing, which yeah. admittedly, <clears throat> it's a flavor. It's not, you know, it isn't scientifically rigorous. None of these personality inventory studies are like DISC or anything yeah. like that. But if you do sufficiently million of them, you will get some trends. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look on 16personalities.com, which is the main Myers-Briggs testing site, I mean, Myers Briggs was a mother and daughter. Did you know that they? Legend has it they developed it to find the right kind of boyfriend. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not. It would be great if it did this amazing sort of system that's dominated the world, and it was all based on is that is that lad easy the right boy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, anyway, um, I, did, I wish I'd known this with my, with my daughter. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's that, that's how to, how to screen potential boyfriends right now let's just do the personality test i just did it by looking at them like clint eastwood sort of like <laughs> squinted eyes like yeah um yeah every dad will understand that one um but yeah the, so the, the the american institute of architects um there was a test there was a myers briggs test done with a group from the university i think i i'll have to dig out the article and it was a limited testing. It was about 150 people they did. Mm-hmm. But what they found was certain personality types, personality types dominated. And one of them was INTJ. Now, the other one was ENTJ. You put those two together in the normal, if you like, in the general population of all the studies that have been done, which runs into hundreds of millions. They are less than 4% of the population of that, those personality types again i stress here this is a flavor it's not rigorous science yeah in the test they did with architects it was 50 percent for those two types which is like extraordinary it's like 13 times as much or 11 times as much what was it It intj and entj entj there's an even rarer one is it infj um, which comes yeah i'm 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 infj you're one of the rarest yeah oh there you go no surprise there. Uh, anyway, um, the certain I, advocate. Yeah. Right, interesting. <laughs> I mean, so if you've got sixteen personalities dot com, INTJ, they call it the architect. Right. Um, and it's it's certain types of characteristics. Now, both groups, if you look at the personalities, they're very specific. They're, they're kind of a almost opposites. You know, they're contradictions, mm-hmm. but they work. So one for INTJ, I think they say the most sort of passionate visionary um, and the bitterest of cynics at the same time, which kind of fits, doesn't it? Yeah. To be an architect, you, you feel like you've got to be a bit of both of those things. You've got to be, you've got to be optimistic to be able to do something like this, because if you're just a pessimist, I don't think you'd be able to cope after a while. Um so to me, it's like, if that's true, and it would be great to redo that survey, although I'm not sure people would necessarily want to find out the results. Um, well, I, th- I think I'm going to hold one of our, some of our listeners and get the audience to kind of do the do the test and send in results. And have, so it's, every poss- it's, it's entirely possible that one-off test was skewed and was weird, okay? And yeah. 
but but even so, for for Myers Briggs to, to call it the architect means that there must be something, you know, yeah. they, they associate a. And if you meet enough architects, and you know this, you will know the type, isn't that you know? And, and I know I'm, I'm making generalities here, but there are certain characteristics that architects have in common, yeah, as well as the things that separate them, of course. Um, and I think there are certain, you know, the kind of things I think about are resilient, um, grit, determination, almost, almost the point of unreasonable stubbornness. I think I think we can all say we've been there. Um, tenacity. You don't get through seven years of training and then the following five years of really understanding of the way the architecture world works. So 12, 10, 12 years, which is like, this is the kind of training that surgeons get, brain surgeons get. Yeah, I mean, and I always say, I think architects have more in common with surgeons than with doctors or lawyers. Because to be a surgeon, you've got to be pretty confident. Mm. I mean, you're going to take a knife to somebody. You're going to, you know what I mean? You've got to be able to have that sort of separation and stuff. And that, so I think, you know, I recognize these very positive qualities in architects, yeah. which which make them extraordinary people. And bearing in mind, it was about 30% of people who start an undergrad course in architecture end up actually qualifying as an architect. Yeah. That was a bigger I'd heard from the RIBA. So you, it's not surprising to me that you got an incredibly tough, resilient, tenacious, possibly even bloody minded <laughs> group of people who trying to drive through an idea that they believe in yeah um it doesn't surprise me that you know other considerations like economics salary status and stuff like that for most of them is almost secondary or tertiary or you know i mean they're not they're not doing it for the money well it's it's interesting you say this you know when when i've spoken to other business consultants who are not architects, but who have worked with a lot of architects mm. and, you know, I've often, often asked them to describe, you know, what is it like working with architects? And they and there, one guy was telling me, he was like, well, it's a bit like you're in a cult is the way to describe it. There's a cult of architecture. And it's like, he's like, and I, don't, I still don't quite get it because I'm not inside of the cult and everyone gets really excited about certain things and you're in there, not driven by money, but there's something about, this magical yeah. thing that they do that's kind of you know they'll sacrifice crazy things in order to to see it happen if you like i genuinely believe most architects are trying to do good and trying yeah. to make the world a better place and that's incredibly laudable and it's a testament to the staying power and in the face of all sorts of difficulties they've faced and I'm, can I just say straight away, I've got massive respect for architects. And although I haven't practiced for 20 odd years, I do know what it feels like. And I think you're right. I, I've said it's a cult before now. I say, well, it's got a belief system. Yep. In, a lot of, in a lot of ways, it, it has, you know, it has a belief system. It has sort of like um, a creed. Mm-hmm. It has certain beliefs, you know, the modern movement, certain is one part of that. Form follows function, less is more. God is in the details, you know. Yeah. Um, dec- you know, ornament is a crime. I mean, I still think that's part of it, actually. <laughs> Can I ask John, uh, Robert Adam? <laughs> um, they don't get much, they get short shrift generally, don't they? You know, Poundbury, things like that. Um, so I'm not being negative. I genuinely think that there's a lot of targeting of architects for certain types of material mm-hmm. cpd marketing material etc and I, I i try and i like to think that i'm sitting with the client going well actually what they need is this because that's what they've said so why don't we give them what the what's going to help them you know shortcuts not shortcuts to doing the wrong thing but shortcuts to what you know being definitive about the kind of knowledge about any particular subject because mm-hmm. architects need to know a little bit about an awful lot of things. Yeah. Um, and it's unreasonable to expect them to know in detail um, subjects. And my favourite one is part B of the building regulations. I mean, on the face of it, it looks reasonable. But when you dig down into fire testing and stuff like that, and I know this is a difficult subject, mm-hmm. but it's extremely complicated. 
And, you know, the problem is for an architect is to be able to work with a fire engineer, for instance. You've got to know part of the answer to ask the question. So even if the architect doesn't know what a fire engineer knows in depth, they've got to go know enough to understand them and implement and apply that. Because an architect's job is to question, not just take it for granted. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 that's, that's kind of my modus operandi. So the more I understand about architects and the way they think, the way they behave more importantly, um, then I think I can be more useful to my clients. And the idea is that they're more useful to, the, to their market. So it's hopefully I'm looking for a win, win, win. What, what, what are some of the mistakes that your clients would typically make when trying to market to architects? There's a whole bunch of them, but the ones I've come across over the past 10, 15 years are they lump architects all together into one category. Right. Now, having said that psychologically architects are particular types, that's a generalization. But what I always say to manufacturers is that architects are not one segment. I break them down into roughly five. It's more than, it could be more than that, but five is about, you can hold that in your head, you know? Yeah. And that's different stages of development and, and their behavior and motivations at each stage. What are those five? Well, you know, the sort of what we call the beginners. Right. Okay. These are meant to be sort of in a, in a sort of an affectionate way. Yes. Um, we also call them, the, and we know we've all been there, the rabbits caught in the headlights. It's like you come out with your degree, you go into your part one, and the first thing you think is, oh, my God, I don't understand any of this, because that's how I felt. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so they're the beginners. Then we have the sort of part two, early part three, and we call those the idealists, because you're fresh out of university, you can make a difference and God bless them. We all felt like that, right? And, you know, you, you, you come up, you're pumped, you, you, you think, I've got these skills, I can make a difference in the world. And, you know, and they do, actually, but probably in more subtle ways than they think, but they do. Yeah. So then we've got the, um, we call the workhorses, which is project architects, um, people coming up to and including associateship. So I always say it's, it's kind of like when you take an idealist and then rub their face into the gravel of working with a contractor um, for a period of time. And so, you know, the workhorses are, and I mean that because they're, they're building a career, they're building buildings, they're managing young staff, they're, you know, it, it's the toughest place to be mm. in some respects. Probably long hours, probably, you know, um, lots of commitment and uh, guidance and mentoring. The next one is we call the influencers, um, which is kind of associates up to partners. Now, the reason I put this is because most CPDs, for instance, are not attended by partners. They're attended by architects and young staff. You know, statistically, over time, I've measured this, and it's at least 60%, 70%, which is what you'd expect. And that's because the older you get, the more you have solutions to hand. So you will, you know, um, jump certain things, which obviously, when it comes to the RIBA CPD recording, you know, it's uh, I've never seen any statistics on this on the more you progress, how much time you actually spend registering your hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the final one, we call them the grey eminences. That's a you need a better expression, really. That's great. And I suppose I'm thinking there of you, you people who are at the top of the game. Zaha did, you know, Foster, you know, um, you know, the figureheads, the kind of the yeah, and yeah, the practices. Patrick yeah. Schumacher yeah. now after you know we lost the incredible Zaha. Yeah. Um, again, that that's just yeah, figureheads, people who. They, they spend most of their time probably design reviews a bit, but mainly marketing and client acquisition, I would have yep. thought. Um, and I was the one joke I was over with, with, uh, with, with one of the former presidents, the RIBOs. I wonder how many are at CPD points that Norman Foster registers every year. <laughs> and whether you dare ask him, 
Um, uh, and anyway, um, it, it, I, I, I don't what mean that. What was the response to that? <laughs> don't know. Um, they laughed, of course, because, you know, it, 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 what, what I can tell you is the research we've done mm. showed that across every demographic I've just described, yeah. architects, most architects, I think I'm talking like 80% or something like that, do two to three times the 35 hours they're required, according to them. They don't record it all and they don't, you know, they, 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 you know, they probably don't realise until they think about it. But when we asked them how many hours they did a year to guesstimate, most of them said a lot more. Now, if it was one group that over-exaggerated it, I get it. And even allowing for some exaggeration or embroidery mm-hmm. that, that's possible because it's anecdotal in some ways. If it, it still says to me that architects do far more than the 30 of hours that, as they're supposed to. Now, whether that's called curriculum and et cetera, all of the characteristics that the RIBA um, are, are talking about is, uh, you know, that's a much deeper exercise. But what I'm saying is architects aren't sitting on their thumbs. You know, they're, they're learning all, all the time and yeah. they're very keen to learn. And they attend. I run the CPD program for Manchester Society of Architects. And we get a lot of people. We did one on the updating building regulations. And we had 180 odd people registered, 170 something, I think it was, 76, something. Like and normally we get about half that number, a bit more, you know, with, with webinars and, and, and events. Yeah. It's, about, it's about that rate. This one, I watched it max out after two minutes. We had 100, we could have this. So we have emails from people saying, I've missed it, I've missed it. So. Um, so I know that they're enthusiastic and, and it depends on the subject, but so, you know, I, I, I say this to manufacturers, that architects really want to understand materials because architects assemble products designed by other people these days. And that's been happening for a hundred years. Um, so they need to know the products and how they work. Aluminium curtain walling systems, you know, roofing systems, you, you name it, rain screen cladding systems, um, and all of the sort of the, you know, what they need to know. Uh, and, and the other things I talk about then is give them guides to, you know, to sort of understand it quickly mm. and reference things that where well, they can find out more, but give them the overview. I call it how-to guides. And they're really successful because if I was a young architect, I wouldn't necessarily want to admit I didn't know something. But if I saw a guide to it, I thought I'll download that and I'll I'll know it. Then I won't appear. I won't ask a daft question. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a lot of people. Who, and again, we're oh, back to psychology I, architect. You I, know, I, I remember that. I was. I remember when I was at, in in Rogers and in Grimshaw. I was so hungry to attend CPDs to learn as much as I possibly could about every aspect of you know from glazing to the to various cladding systems that those were really great opportunities to learn well my view is actually a lot of the ed- construction education that architects learn is actually through manufacturers because they're not you know as far as i can tell they're not learning a huge amount of university um you know understanding the way architects behave and think um and do it from a point of view where I understand it because I, I, I appreciate if I haven't practiced for 20 years and that's why I'd, I'm very careful with this. Mm. Things have changed. But as the French say, what do they say? You know, plus ça change. I mean, the more things change, the more things stay the same. There are certain aspects of being an architect that are the same as they were 50 years ago. And so I think I still understand the mindset. And, you know, um, that's why I think, you know, with some of the industries and institutions that surround the profession, having people in there who went some of the way in an architecture training, they're going to have a bit more empathy and a bit more yep. understanding of the architect situation in whether in a small practice or in a major practice. There's, there's I mean, I don't know, you know, actually, if you work for some big practices, I work for BDP. I worked a bit with Shepard Robson, um, uh, not Shepard Robson, sorry, the Rock Townsend, Rock Townsend. Um, we, had, we had a relationship with them, um, with the practice in Manchester. 
for a while. And then I went by to medium sized practice. And of course, small, I, I used to work with the, I tell that story of the guy I worked with in Hyde. And I was, he was a one man operation. Right. And I got, I came in ill one day and he said, I'll, I'll ring up the local doctor and he'll get, his, get some antibiotics. So he got me an appointment with this doctor, went down, this grumpy guy. But he gave him some antibiotics. I found out later his name was Harold Shipman. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Like you couldn't make it up in Hyde and Cheshire. Um, so that was a that's that's a good that's a good sort of party uh, party story. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like why I'm interested. In. I mean, it's interesting anyway. I think as, as yeah. a, because it does affect their decision making. And the one thing that's become clear, and Arxex not alone in this. That if you look at the work done by people like well, you'll be, you know this already, you know Daniel Kahneman, you know Richard Thaler, and Daniel, you know Dan Ariely. Yeah, we know that in, even in business, people make emotional decisions, and we tend to rationalise it later. Um, Rory Sutherland from um, Ogilvy One said this on LinkedIn marketing, B two B marketing. So it's it's. To me, the, the, the tricky bit is combining the rational bit with the emotional bit. You know, people make decisions and are driven by emotional drivers. Um, and then you, you have to supply the evidence to back that, that, that up. Um, and that does affect the way that marketing works. I mean, we know this, but, but, but um, if you appeal to the rational, you're missing a trick. And... I do say this to occasionally to the occasional architects who, you know, ask me about marketing. And one thing I say to them is empathy with your client is and showing that empathy mm. with their position is probably one of the greatest kind of um, tools for success. Understanding the pain, what we call the pain chain. Right. It's solution selling this stuff, you know, understand your clients' pains, and that isn't always the same thing as what they're asking you to do. That's the tricky bit. Um, can, you, can, you, can, you, gonna, can, you, can you give us a bit of an example of that? Because that's quite, that's quite interesting. And how, and how does that relate to knowing what our own psychology is as architects? You know the old adage, the queen thinks the world smells of emulsion paint. <laughs> Everywhere she goes, they've just painted it, and so she's got. I mean, it's a joke, I know, but it's it's, it's a bit of an element of truth in it, you know. Um, I think there's a danger that any profession or any group with a particular, you know, um, whatever it be, social media or, or you know, mm -hmm. you know, if you're Facebook, if you're you know, if you're one of Steve Jobs' acolytes in in, in Apple, you have a certain worldview. And this, we know this is being reinforced by social media. That's one of its huge downsides. Yeah. Um, we tend to have a dialogue with the people who believe what we, what we believe as opposed to, and we tend to reject what other people believe. So if you're talking to a client who wants you to, you know, do a planning application on the site and, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're trying to generate you know, a, a project. And of course, the problem for most developers is at the early stages where they, they have to cash flow a lot of things before they get any certainty. So now you could argue, well, that's their risk, right? You know, that's their problem. But the world's more complicated than that now. And so identifying that, for instance, that the client's most difficult part is pre-planning, which is what an architect told me recently about their approach. And if you can help them with that, you can benefit more down the line. You've got to get the message right and you've got to get the, but what you're demonstrating is I understand your problem yeah. and I will work with you to overcome your problem because if I look after you, you'll look after me. Now, yes, we're in the area of humans here <clears throat> and some people will take advantage of that, of course, mm -hmm. but it's, I, I, can't believe that's the rule. I think most most developers are conscious of their reputations, yeah, and um, and would act honourably within the guidelines and of their business. 
So it's not an excuse to say do something for nothing. That's not the that's not the approach. What you're saying is, I can run work my business model with your business model, but at some point I've got to be paid. Yeah, you know, I've got I need to be paid what I'm worth, and if I get you planning permission, then I'm, that's quite a lot. You know, that's because the minute you get planning permission on a piece of land, that value of that land rockets, right? So. So it's perfectly reasonable at that point for the architect to say, you know, I've created that value. Mm. Um, but it's about talking their language as opposed to what I see an awful lot, which is we have to educate clients. No, no. It, it, clients educate us. I mean, this is a common trope in consumer marketing. We have to educate the consumer. It's completely wrong. The consumer educates the company. And there's plenty of evidence when that happened. Coca-Cola in 1986. You know, um, my favourite one, um, what's his name? Prawn Sandwich. What's his name? I know. Gerald Ratner. <laughs> to do a Ratner, Google it, okay? You don't, you know, you, you, was it the, well, what was it one of the, was it the CEO of Coca-Cola said? that they don't own their own brand. They hold it in trust for the consumer. And I would say, I've said that's, that to you so about the RIBA. Yeah. The yeah. RIBA, my feeling, and going back to psychology of architects, my feeling is that the main reason why architects are members of the RIBA is because it's the best representation of their achievement. To put ARB, it, nobody knows what ARB is, but RIBA, people know what it is. And so was it, what was it we said? Four hard-earned letters. So and I've said this to a couple of presidents. Um, I've said, you don't own those letters. The RIBA doesn't own them. They think they do. And as a brand, they do in, in strict terms. I'm not saying that. I says, but I think the real value of the RIBA brand is in the minds of the people who use the letters. And that signifies a huge amount of effort and achievement and pain and sweat and anguish. And they've earned those letters the hard way. And I think that's what, that to me is what RIBA means, actually. That's um, so interesting to think, to, to think about it like that, about that. That's actually, the power of it is more that it's a kind of symbol for us to acknowledge the 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 yeah the journey if you like of becoming an architect yeah and you know I, I even now i strictly speaking i can call myself an architect because i don't practice and there's not you know i'm not breaking any code of conduct by doing that mm -hmm. but it doesn't sit right with me so i still pay my arb subs i have done for 20 years now i don't you know i, I don't practice but i think it's not you know it would be hypocritical of me not to you know to be members of this stuff and continue my in, 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 my um, sort of membership because it keeps me grounded it makes me realize what it was all about in the first place yeah and why i think all of our they, they probably wouldn't articulate it this way mm -hmm. i'm looking at it from a marketing perspective that's why i mean by the riba letters the real value of them is in the minds of the of the of the, the practicing community, the architect community, right. as opposed to an abstract organisation. And I think they probably agree with that actually. Yeah. Um, and that's the case with most of these things, by the way. Most professional bodies, the RIBA aren't unusual in that. Um, <clears throat> so the symbiosis between an institute that represents the profession, the profession itself, they are the, effectively the same thing. Mm. And you cannot have one without the other, in a way. Um, so psychologically, it's interesting, that isn't it? Because there isn't a huge amount of engagement with the institute. I think most people will say, but they still treasure those letters. Yeah, well, it's 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 the same it's the same thing as well. You can kind of see that further extended with the RIBA uh, site boards that you get. You know, the kind of traditional red site red, boards red board, that, yeah, yeah. that put you know, from a marketing perspective, probably aren't the aren't the most useful things for a consumer to look at. 
um when I mean, they kind of indicate immediately that oh it's it's the RABA but they but they all you know they all look the same in terms of other architects using them but there's often that when you set up your first practice um that kind of instagram image or selfie that you do holding yeah. your site board <laughs> And it, I remember and it, it, but it was, it, it, it was an Instagram then, but it was yeah, definitely a it, photograph. You know? Exactly. It's like a form of graduation in a way. It's like well, that, actually, it's, I've got all this uh, like graduation of, photograph. It's an important marker and it's like, oh Yeah, it's it's a, it's a you know, it's it's a, yeah, you're right, it's a sort of a moment in time. I've got another sort of thought about the RIG red architect science, and that is do you ever go and buy a bottle of port or whiskey or cognac? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, there the, are the, the, you know, like VSOP or something mm-hmm. XO or something like this. Yeah, your Hennessy's, yeah, now, yeah. And if you look at if you look at particularly in port, they have like a seal over the cap of the cork, don't they? The bottle cap. Yeah. They sometimes have a serial number, it, but it's it, it looks a lot of the time it looks like it's a duty thing. But but then you'll find little medallions and little shields and things like that. And, you know, it, a, a, another example would be you know. By uh, by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen, you know, on, the, on your packet of cornflakes, or yeah. you know, what I mean, that still is still carries a lot of weight with consumers, that you know, right? Um, especially older consumers, they 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 put some, you know, kind of even the Queen eats cornflakes, you know. Um, I think it's a bit like that. It's it's like um, the way you're describing consumer is it's 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 about premiumization. It's Basically, that this is not only pre, it's premium because it's judged, it has quality standards applied to it. So, you know, it's more trustworthy. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's got quite a lot to do with that. You know, it's an endorsement, got it, you know, a seal of approval. And I think that's the RAB Red Sign is definitely a bit of that. The thing you've got on your 12 bottle, 12 year old malt, yeah, you know. Um, still, it still has that gravitas cachet as well I'd cachet, say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. so you know the, it's a strange situation because on the one hand it carries a lot of meaning but that meaning doesn't get necessarily communicated through to certain actors in the value chain mm. anymore in the same way which is a problem and um Another thing is obviously with the positive, very positive aspects of psychology, there is always a kind of a shadow side to it, as Carl Jung would say, there's the shadow. And and that is some of the things that perhaps architects aren't as you know, proud of, you know, and um and again, I'm I'm not singing out this profession because it's the same in any profession or walk of life. There's always a positive side, there's always the, the flip side of the coin yeah. of where People talk about architects in a negative way. You know, you hear it all the time, I'm sure. You know, obsessed, egotistical, arrogant is one word they hear a lot. And I often say to people, no, you're mistaking arrogance for something else. But, you know, once it's out there, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you know. And, and we know who the people are who want to devalue that. And, you know, uh, we've lived through it and I, I don't want to get into that sort of detail, but we know who in whose interest it is to keep the architect in that place. Yeah. Yeah. From being an architect, what are, what's, how does understanding our psychology help us be better salespeople, be better marketeers, be better architects? What does Socrates say? I love quoting this know thyself yeah um my other favorite quote by the way is hannibal lecter <laughs> i think i've told you this one in silence of the lambs watch it it's really you can find it on youtube he's in the cage in the middle of this hall and jodie foster comes up with the roller drawings and she wants him because he knows who the killer is and she wants him to tell him and he won't yeah and so he says to her simplicity read marcus aurelius yeah um of any given thing, ask what is its nature? What is its purpose? What does he do, this man you seek? Yeah, what does he do? Um, was it he covets? And how do we learn to covet? We covet by what we see every day. And of course, that's the clue, because that's how they found him in the, in, in, in the, in the film. Yeah. So Marcus Aurelius, brilliant. 
the reason to understand our psychology is quite simple because then we can compensate for the less helpful aspects of that kind of determination right you know the, the, there's all you know it's, it's there's always a balance to be struck so for instance INTJ, ENTJ, the polarity there is introvert, extrovert. The people who are natural salespeople tend to be more extrovert. You know, they, they, they may not be fully extrovert, they can be borderline, but what you'll find is in any business is that there'll always be somebody who eventually ends up being new biz. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that because it happened to me. I, I couldn't stand the idea of doing new business because it's like, oh, God, I've got to phone people up. I've got to chase people. You know, all those things that feel a bit undignified. Yeah. But I was the only one to, who could do it. So I, I learned how to do it. And you learn that actually there's a huge, it's a massively important part of a business. And it's not to be decried and it's not to be, look the scans at it's essential it's like the oxygen of the business i mean you so you know understanding your own psychology is, is is and the way that within the selection criteria of architecture the room for variation there yeah. in theory you can then and i've done this with my previous agency but we weren't the uh, uh, it was a, 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 psych a psychology sort of a consultancy. And basically we did profiling on all of the directors on what their skill sets were and what their best place would be. So what you can do is figure out where people feel the most comfortable and where they are best placed right. to benefit the business. So it's a useful business tool as well. Um, but it also you know, means that you can check yourself sometimes when you're being unreasonable. But it's, it's, it's interesting. We use um, like the disc profile quite yeah. a lot. I find that quite a useful, you know, it's an, it's an easy, you know, the, it's, I find it a lot easier than Maya Briggs to use because you can remember the different quadrants a bit more easily. But it, it, and again, like you said, it's not necessarily grounded in loads of scientific accuracy, perhaps, and that people are, people's personalities are kind of fluid, dynamic. Yeah, di dynamic. And it's strange as well, of course. Exactly. And you, but, but it helps identify, you know, areas for improvement or if I want to move into a different sector or, or different area in, in role or position or a practice, want, or someone in the practice wants to take more leadership, then there are going to be certain characteristics of different quadrants that can be learnt and can be used and are important. Exactly. To understand. Well, that's the process we use. We have like a three day business psychology and we use this profile and, you know, I went through all of that. And it, it, it is, it is, it's good in looking for general attributes. It's not, like I say, it's, it's largely based on Jungian psychology, isn't it? Yeah. And, 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 you know, personality types and archetypes. Um, Cause there's enough, there's nothing about behind this about what the archetype of the architect is, which is interesting as well. And what I mean by that is the way other media, other, the media, for instance, that the cinema or TV use the architect in a story or a book, you know, whatever it is, yeah. The architect, if there's an architect in the role in the book and there's loads of films on that, 12 Angry Men, Towering Inferno, um, Jungle Fever, Flipper Purify, what a great name. Um, that was Wesley Snipes, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Indecent Proposal. Indecent Proposal. Uh, I always loved Wesley Snipes' brace in that one. It was so 80s, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and of course, more recently, um, you know, Knock Knock with uh, Keanu Reeves. And um, there was a TV program set in Scotland with two female architects called The Replacement. Right. Now, the, usually the story is about something to human nature, not to do with architecture, because I think trying to do a, a limited series on architecture would be a pretty dull watch. You know, it's not, it's not got human drama in like medical drama or legal dramas do, um, or police procedural dramas, which is the cheapest of them all. But they use an architect. It's because they symbolise something, right? There's a, there's, an, there's, a, there's a common perception of what, even no matter how vague it is, of what an architect is and does and believes. So it's kind of a zip file of meaning, if you like. You know, it's uh, so. I'm always interested in that. Like, what you know? I mean, they've usually been male in the past because that was the 
well, the, you know, the, the larger the makeup of the profession was back then. It's obviously changing, and that's good. And at this thing where, where the, the replacement was interesting because it told a different kind of story. But essentially, still, it relied on the basis that these two people were architects, so therefore they were highly skilled, rational, intelligent, um, you know, perceptive, insightful people. They weren't, you know, this wasn't just a sort of a, you know, a fist fight in the street, you know, this was psychological drama, you know. Um, so I'm interested in the way that, if you like, the, the outside, the, the, the greater world, I won't say the general public, because I don't believe in that, but, yeah. you know, outside viewing audiences, think of what an architect is. And one of those things is they think that most of them think that they're very well paid. You know, it's a misperception. Sophisticated, urbane, empathic, you know, driven. Yeah. Um, sort of, you know, um, visionary. And of course, you know, if you have an architect, that, that, that means then there's a bunch of sort of attributes, uh, psychological attributes, which are assigned to that person. You don't have to explain. You don't have to have a paragraph at the beginning saying, what an architect does, you know what I mean? People sort of, ah, architect. And it has a certain association to that. Well, that, that's interesting as well, kind of going back, linking it to the, and I've, I've heard you speak about this before, the, the kind of collective value that the word architect has. Mm. Right? There's a kind of collective brand, if you like, using the word yeah. architect, which is kind of drawing upon what the archetype of the architect is and how people perceive it. So, you know, there's, I've often thought about, well, what would happen if you dropped the word architect and started calling yourself something else? Because, you know, like a home designer or, 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 or whatever, is there any value in that? Or is actually the, the weighting of the word architect because of this archetypal psychology or the archetypal image that is kind of held in the public actually has a lot of value to it yeah i mean i i, I still happen to think that the, the title architect is incredibly important because it, mm. effectively it's a brand in itself uh, i mean if you think about again in terms of marketing you know you could say that architect is like if you again you know the old thing i said walking around the supermarket okay you you have categories of product okay so what what we say here? Um, <laughs> gotta give you lasagna. <laughs> okay. S- stick with me; it, it does make sense. Lasagna is the most bought chilled ready meal in the UK by a country mile. Everybody thinks it's chicken tikka masala. It's not. That's the actual most popular chilled. That's the most popular popular takeaway. The most popular chilled ready meal is lasagna, because. Everybody loves a lasagna, right? It's you can eat it with a fork, you can watch eat it in front of the telly. You know, it's it's delicious, it's fabulous, and it's a pain in the neck to make. It takes ages. So no surprisingly, people, everybody, I mean, it's one of the it's a, but anyway. So consequently, with something that that's that big a category, yeah. we're talking yeah. hundreds of millions of pounds here. You will get different categories within that overall category of lasagna you will get different types of product so at the one end of it you'll have the the value range you know which which is figures in most of the the, you know, the, the multiples tesco sainsbury's asda and then you'll get the charlie bigham which is the little wooden crate thing um yeah. which is like one's Two ninety nine, two forty nine. This one is like seven quid, and you can argue, well, it's lasagna, right? Well, yes and no. How does it differ? Well, ingredients, yeah, size. Um, it's mainly ingredients, but okay. But a big element of that is brand. Okay, so you perceive it's better. You know, the, in marketing, the, the the adage goes that people tend to um, they tend to value what they pay for, not the other way around. So, if you buy a if you buy a Charlie Bigham's lasagna, thinking I'm going to have a great lasagna experience. Now, if you take architect as a category, you got your value architect. value range, and you got your Charlie Bigham's at one end. Well, a slightly different description, but at one end, you got people doing 
one-off housing extensions, alterations. Yeah. Um, it takes a huge amount of skill. Anybody who's tried to do a house or even extend a house knows how tricky it is. People yeah. tend to massively oversimplify. It's like one of those kids' puzzles where you move the squares around to get them in order. You know, a house is one thought. Somebody said to me, um, at the other end of the scale, you've got people doing airports and stadia and these incredible, you know, and some major world-leading practices. Um, and at the other end of it, you've got your equivalent of your general practitioner architect. But they all share the same basic characteristic, which is the category. So to me, the category language of architects is really important. If you follow my, my meaning on this, yeah. Yeah. if you start to call lasagna something else, people wouldn't know what it was and they wouldn't buy it. But lasagna, <clears throat> lasagna is a, you know, is, is an idea, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, and beneath that, then you can choose all sorts of things: it's vegan, organic. So, you know, so, so what? So what happens? What are your thoughts on as well of other professions using the word architect? Does that then extend that kind of even even beyond? I think it's, it's reasonable to say that you know um, the, the, the I think just to, to be honest, where the ARB really probably didn't help a long time ago. But, you know, in IT architecture, I mean, that was I think that's sloppy. Their argument is, well, it, you know, it's a different category, which is true. But if architecture is going to be a legally protected title, then now it's always a legally protected title within the built environment. That's a bit of a problem, okay? Um, but in another sense, you could say it's like calling yourself doctor if you historian as opposed to a, you know, um, uh, you know, a, Obstetri obstetrician for instance yeah landscape architect i think yeah i, I think that's confusing um I, I'll, I'll 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 actually mentioning i'm not particularly proud of but somebody's trying to link it with me on linkedin the other day described themselves as an interior architect oh yeah so i looked at them and i went down to their profile and they had a, they had a degree in art, uh, interior design so I wrote back to them, message them. I didn't do it publicly, I did it in a message. And I said, I said, are you registered with the ARB? And they came back saying, what? what? Why'd you ask that? I said, because using the title architect in the construction sector, and it's a legally protected title. And I copied a link to the Architects Registration Act, 1997. I said, I said may I suggest sort of, respectfully that you remove the title architect from your LinkedIn profile because you're not an architect. Now, a lot of people would say like, why bother? And I think, well, it's because every time that happens, it gets chipped away at somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the more, more worrying thing is that somebody who engages the services of somebody calls themselves an architect and they're not an architect is being misled that these people are, are subject to a code, a set of code of conduct and regulations that they're not. Yeah. And I think, so it's in a, in a kind of way, uh, there is a reasonable argument that it's consumer protection or client protection. I mean, most professional clients know what they're doing, know what an architect is, and they know the difference between somebody who says they're an architect and architectural technologies, for instance, yeah. <laughs> um, which is an entirely different thing. So to, to me, it's it's important that you preserve the the brand positioning, if you like, and you don't let let it get eroded. Mm. And you and the best thing to do that is, is have clear blue water between people who use an architect derivative like architectural, but the word pure architect on its own. I think that's you know that that's really important. I think it's important to the architect psychologically. It's important to the client and the end users because there is a, you know, a brand is a promise. And the type, the brand architect has promises built into it. Yeah. And, and I think that's why it's important. Absolutely. Um, you asked me a question on how psychology can help architects win clients. Is that what you're right? Or yeah. Yeah. How, 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 can, how can it make us better salespeople? How can it... Help well, again, know thyself, right? Yeah. If you if you understand your own personality, or 
the psychological drivers. Um, I mean, to understand your own personality is probably impossible, but to you want to understand what drives you and what your belief systems are and what your, you know, um, how you do what you, why you think what you think. Um, and that's a really positive thing, by the way. That's not a criticism. Um, it allows you then to think, to think, okay, well, if I think like that, what do other people think like? What's their value system? You know, so the one diagram I've got has said that the, the main motivation of an architect is Vitruvian principles. <laughs> and if you interview an architect and get them to talk for a while, they'll soon talk to you about, about good workable spaces, you know, um, well, well lit, well organized spaces, right? So that's, you know, commodity. You know, some of this robust and you know, you know, low maintenance things like okay, um, firmness, and that inspires people to want to go to work or, you know, gives it makes them feel good about where they live. Delight, Vitruvian principles. Okay, a contractor and subcontractor are not driven by Vitruvian principles. Yeah. They're driven by Keynesian principles. You know, you go further along the value chain to universities, hospitals you will have a thing there which is more to do with um, Maslowian or utilitarian principles. Yeah. You know, the best possible good for the most possible people or, mm. you know, aspiring to lifting people to feel, you know, um, in, in Maslowian terms, to feel proud of where they are. And it has a positive effect on their psychology. And so this isn't theoretical nonsense. This is real world stuff. Mm. So for an architect to understand the motivations of people in the value chain, I think is important in being successful because then you can empathize with, understand, or even if you think it's brutal, you can, at least you understand it. Yeah. And, you know, that, that that's the key, isn't it? Absolutely. Knowledge is power, right? So in that sense. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, Paul, I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude that fascinating conversation on the psychology. Of there wasn't too much nonsense in that, but you no, know, that, I do that, a little bit, you know. That's, that's great. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. You're welcome. Thanks, Ryan. Nice to see you again. Take it easy. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.